As people in this world who are concerned about their future, about their children, about their children's children, this is not just about this moment, but about what kind of world is going to be left to the future. Will it be a world where, you know, self-defense is defined as justifying genocide of an entire people that are considered inconvenient? For six months, people have watched Israel's war on Gaza, while words like genocide, veto, ICJ and apartheid have become part of the daily news lexicon. For some, it can be difficult to follow and fully understand. Noura Araqat, an associate professor and human rights attorney, helps to explain the colonial structure of rule in Palestine and the UN's mandate there. Noura Araqat, welcome to Center Stage. Thank you for having me, Noura. <laughs> Thank you. So. After six months of war, the long-awaited UN Security Council resolution is here, 2728. Uh, yet Israel says it's not forced to follow it. Uh, it's not binding for Israel. Is it or is it not? It's absolutely bound, binding. That's non -co not controversial. We see in the UN Charter, according to Article 25, that Security Council resolutions are binding on all member states in order to uphold it. Israel is doing what it continues to do, which is to say that it deserves an exception. It deserves an exception to occupation law. It deserves an exception to the laws of war. It deserves an exception to the prohibition on genocide in order to fulfill what it considers um, its cause of maintaining Zionism by absolute coercive of force against the will of the international community and in what we see as continuing crimes against all of humanity. Now, what I think there's been a, a tremendous amount of a focus on is it binding, is it not binding, because the U.S. tried to assert this as well in its miraculous abstention from the Security Council resolution. And I think that what we should take away from it is really what it means between the U.S. and Israel. Up until this point, the U.S. has isolated itself and Israel as the international community has affirmed that it wants a ceasefire three times. We've seen the extraordinary um, in invocation of uniting for peace resolution where the General Assembly attempts to overcome a Security Council veto. We've seen the extraordinary invocation of Article 99 by Secretary General Antonio Guterres in order to affirm that, that there needs to be a ceasefire. And so in, in the U.S. veto, it's used three times. And in the rejection of these extraordinary invocations, the U.S. has isolated itself together with Israel. By pivoting, pivoting away in this moment, it's basically now isolating Israel further. And I think signifies for us U.S. opposition to the Israeli invasion of Rafah, as well as really what's embarrassing, the fact that it can't enforce access to humanitarian aid. Why should the U.S., which is providing um, Israel with um, weapons mm -hmm. and the impunity in order to conduct th this genocide, which is also a U.S. genocide, this is a U.S. war on Palestinians, need to appeal to the Israelis in order to deliver humanitarian aid or to drop it um, mm -hmm. on Palestinians. And so I think that this is, this is um, something that's internal. Both Israel and the U.S. are playing to their domestic audiences. This is internal and in mm -hmm. signaling disagreement with the policy. But on the world stage, we see that it's not having the impact it should. Speaking of Rafah invasion, uh, the minute uh, the resolution was uh, passed, um, Netanyahu withdrew his delegation that was supposed to discuss the plan to invade uh, Rafah uh, with Washington. And then um, a couple of hours ago, they uh, he actually said that they're going back again. How is this happening? Like, so much of this is political theater. We don't actually know what's happening, right? Maybe the U.S. and Israel are planning this together to play good cop, bad cop, right? But they're 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 doing something in contravention of our international will. Mm -hmm. as people in this world who are concerned about their future, about their children, about their children's children, right? This is not just about this moment, but about what kind of world is going to be left to the future that we leave behind, who will inherit this mm -hmm. earth. Will it be a world where, you know, self-defense is defined as justifying genocide of an entire people that are considered inconvenient, be they indigenous people like the Palestinians or a racialized minority elsewhere? And so I you know, what happens next also shouldn't be left to two uh, military powers, the U.S. being global superpower and Israel being the 11th most significant military power in the world, the only nuclear power in the Middle East. We should not be an audience to this to wait to decide how they 
come out with an outcome. But remember that we are empowered to actually shift course. So for example, the International Court of Justice determined on January 26, 2024, that this is plausibly genocide. Mm -hmm. We have been given the tools to signal to now 192 other member states, excluding the United States and Israel, to mobilize, to meet their uh, responsibility of preventing genocide. So often we think of the Genocide Convention as only punishment, but the primary purpose of the Genocide Convention is to prevent it. And so now they have as their obligation the duty to prevent this ongoing genocide, and that includes arms embargo, mm -hmm. that includes the cutting of diplomatic sanctions, that includes not, you know, defense for the Palestinians mm -hmm. in this moment. And so we look so much to Israel and the United States, but that's disempowering us and letting all these other states off the hook. There's only been nine states and one regional entity, the African Union, that have actually cut diplomatic ties with Israel. What's going on with the other 100 now and 82 states mm -hmm. that could do the same? those that have relations with Israel. What about arms embargo? Why are we only, I, we have to be overly concerned with the U.S., but there are other countries that have arms trade with Israel. But and we should be focusing cut, on them. Uh, sending arms to Israel. Many countries started cutting arm, uh, sending arms Many to did, many more must. Mm -hmm. And so the emphasis here, I think it's very disempowering. It makes us more helpless when we think of this overwhelming power of the United States and Israel in a way that diminishes our own power and the actions that we could be taking. And I think that what millions of people across the globe, especially Palestinian youth, who are organizing, they're organizing streets, their university students, their campuses, their communities, who have r risen in upheaval and uprising, they have demonstrated to us how much power we have. Mm -hmm. If we just waited for states to save us, it would have been a completely different history. When you say that this, um, this U.S. decision in, at the U.N. Security Council was in response to internal audience. Uh, to which point is Biden and the, his administration responding to the mass pro uh, protest we've been seeing in Washington to the fact that there's election coming? We cannot, I, I, know, I hear what you're saying that we cannot just put it all on the states, but it still has its uh, a veto. Power in the a UN. thousand percent. But this is also bringing up a crisis in international regulation beyond Palestine. Consider that, you know, for example, you have an ICJ decision that demanded that Russia cease its hostilities against the Ukraine two years ago, mm -hmm. and that's not been forthcoming. Note also that because China is a veto wielding power, there's an ongoing uh, you know, genocide of the Uyghur population in China. Mm -hmm. So that we know that there is a problem of international governance that's mm -hmm. embodied and captured in the Security Council within itself. You have t 15 members, five of them are permanent veto, you know, are, are permanent members with veto power who can overcome the will of the international community. And so this is not the first time that we're confronting this. And in fact, some of, you know, some Areas of hope for those who have been calling for its amendment have expressed, as has Malaysia, has said, you cannot use mm. veto power in order to, to uh, you know, block the suspension of mass atrocities, as is taking place in Palestine right now. And so this agitation should lead us to crisis points that lead mm. to these amendments rather than, you know, continuing on with a status quo. I've been hearing uh, uh, the idea of reforming the UN Security Council, the idea of uh, reforming the power of the international community, when, uh, especially in terms of stopping wars and preventing genocides. If we want to be practical, what needs to be done? Should, the, should we remove the veto power? I think that's what most people in the world would like to do. Why isn't it that we don't have the will of, you know, m majoritarian will of the General Assembly mm -hmm. uh, and what it can do on behalf of all peoples? Now, mind you, that won't remove the politics. Mm. And we might similarly find uh, challenges, but at least, at least it would shift the undue and mm. unjust power of those veto holding members. But the reason that there was a ve that veto power is because those world powers would have refused to enter and be members of the uh, of the United Nations if it existed. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that that 
um, politics is precisely why not all of them are members of even the International Criminal Court. Notice that the International Criminal Court has three forms of jurisdiction, how you can bring something before the court. One of them is a Security Council rever referral. Well, three out of the five veto-holding members of, of the Security Council are not even parties mm -hmm. to the Rome Statute, and yet they have the authority to refer cases to the ICC. So this problem of international governance, right, and what, what the uh, veto holding powers is endemic, not just in this moment, but in these other fora that we might have available to us. But then you have the conundrum, remove the veto powers, they're no longer parties to it. There's a reason that these states continue to comply in an unjust system because there's also some benefit to it. And especially we're looking now, when we look at their history, when they were created, they were created with, at the same time of the Nakba of your own people. That's correct. This is very contradictory. How can we find justice there? The first thing that I want to say is that the 1948 Genocide Convention, which proscribed the, the uh, destruction of people in whole or in part, um, is, is, happens in 1948, but that wasn't the first genocide. Mm. That wasn't the first, you know, the, the genocide of Jewish people in Europe was not the first genocide that we saw in the world. And so even in the Genocide Convention itself, right, we see an obfuscation of the colonial violence that really tells the history of the world. We see that also in the Rome Statute, where of the core crimes that are pr proscribed, colonialism isn't one of them, right? So the, here are the, the injustice mm -hmm. of international law that's structural, that's embedded. And as far as Palestinians are concerned, you have a moment where the Nekba amongst the prime things that it did, obviously ethnic cleansing, removal, but it was the usurpation of the self-determination of the Palestinian people. And so in this moment, Palestinians could not become party to a genocide convention as that was limited as a right to states, right? Palestinians couldn't be recognized. And it also limited the ability to actually prosecute Israel for whom it was said that the genocide convention was, was legislated. And so here you, again, structural problems that many creative advocates, ad activists, leaders, and lawyers, in addition, not primarily, are trying to overcome in this moment. So justice will come through politics, not through law? Justice will come through people. Justice will come through people, as it's always come through people. You know, oftentimes, you know, people say we need rule-based order, we need more laws, but the most unjust regimes are very lawful. Apartheid in South Africa, full of law, very meticulous. Third Reich, Nazi regime, full of law, very meticulous. Apartheid in the United States, known as Jim Crow, full of law, very meticulous, right? So this idea that we need more law is, is not where we should be going. Right. But even politics, politics is oftentimes, you know, the nego it, uh, it is not oftentimes. It always is the negotiation over scarce resources. Mm -hmm. So it creates a mutually exclusive um, equation. Some will have others will not. It never creates a mutually reinforcing possibility. Who then mm -hmm. creates the alternatives for us? People mm -hmm. always have in community with one another, in the way that they take care of one another. I have never seen a more hopeful future than I have in the way that Palestinians in Gaza have cared for one another mm -hmm. and have shown us what humanity is, who as they've been bombarded and subject to tremendous loss, have wished mercy upon the rest of the world that they, no one is subject to what they're subject to. This is our future. This is where we draw lessons. The fact that the rest of us have responsibility to do something with it is we're not the saviors, we're tools. And all of us collectively are the tools that are mobilizing that. In response to that, what do American voters have uh, as a responsibility in the coming elections? All the responsibility. American vo Americans oftentimes, because they are in the center of empire, are, you know, I you know, hate to say this because many, you know, I'm, I'm an American, hmm. right? Um, but there's a willful in ignorance and we are subject to an incredible of, uh, amount of the manufacturing of consent, of distraction. And so don't have a very great grasp on geography. Don't understand that we are an empire. Mm -hmm. The United States is an empire. It continues to occupy Hawaii. 
Mm. It continues to be a colonial power in Puerto Rico. It continues settler colonial expansion across, you know, what's known as Turtle Island um, and the removal and elimination of native peoples. It continues to maintain a race, you know, based system against racialized minorities, primarily African Americans. Most Americans don't don't have this conception to then understand what the U.S. is doing, you know, abroad in other mm -hmm. colonial geographies. And so, but the responsibility is in the United States because this is a U.S. war. This is a U.S. war. And in fairness, in fairness, 80% of Democratic voters actually want a ceasefire, mm -hmm. right? There was an other resignation of a State Department official just yesterday. There's been three leaked State Department memos. There's been protests from a thousand um, employees of USAID. So from the top levels of government to the very bottom, we see people in protest, but we also see the fiction of democratic governance. Mm -hmm. You would think that 80% of a democratic you know, desire to end uh, this genocide would result in the administration and its leadership responding, but they don't. Mm -hmm. So this this romanticization that the U.S. as a democracy is actually obfuscating the, the truth, which is that even the United States and Americans don't live in a democratic order where their will is represented. And yet there continues to be protests. And I think a lot of hope, mm -hmm. a lot of hope in an entire generation that refuses to be gaslit an entire generation that refuses this, the, you know, the repression um, from university administrators, from governments, you know, municipal governments to state governments, which have even outlawed boycott. And so as much as there is despair and there is a tremendous amount of despair, there's also an equal amount of hope. And I think that's where we've all been suspended mm. between this place of despair and hope mm -hmm. in this moment. There is a lot of hope in the younger generation. There's also a lot of hope in history. No colonial uh, regime managed to um, to stay and occupy with the presence of uh, mm -hmm. the native uh, people. But what we're seeing is ethnic cleansing. They're pushing people out of Gaza and so on. So how, how this new generation that is very vocal about Palestine, uh, how can they actually um, make it stop and give Palestine back to Palestinians? Well, I think, you know, let's just acknowledge, you know, so many of us have said this is ethnic cleansing, yet Israelis have told us this is ethnic cleansing. Mm. Very explicitly, mm. right? Avi Dichter said in November 2023, this is the Gaza Nakba. This is Nakba 2023. So nobody is trying to lie about what this is, right? That they, they're telling us very explicitly. And yet it's Western governments mm. that have tried in order to facilitate it because so much of Western civilization, if not all of it, is built on genocide. This is their history. And Israel in that way is no different than these other Western civilizations. And so, but this is a history of the world. Mm -hmm. Genocide is the history of, of so many peoples, which is why you see the millions rising, which is why you see this confrontation become a confrontation between very explicitly a global south, you know, former colonized peoples against the global north, those that continue to colonize even uh, to the present. So what does this mean for a generation that's not yet in power, for a generation that doesn't yet have, right, the reins of government? the reins of university leadership, the reins of the head of, of global institutions, when they are now raised understanding that Zionism, contrary to what they've been told, is not a national liberation movement, but Zionism is a racist colonial regime on par with other racist colonial regimes that is not legitimate but is a form of racism and racial discrimination that then doesn't become part of the ethos that constructs them, but becomes part of the ethos against which they work. I came to this interview today with a, with a heavy heart because I woke up to this um, post for, of a uh, of, um, Gazan journalist. Uh, she's a young girl, uh, very inspiring, of course, like all the Gazans uh, right now, all the Palestinians right now with their resilience, with their, uh, hope for the future, but she had this, she posted this question. What do you talk about with someone who knows they're going to die in the coming hours? Mm. What do we tell them? Amazing, amazing what these young people continue to teach us. I don't, what, what do we say? Sorry? I mean, I would begin with an apology that we haven't been able to do more 
that we haven't been more effective, that we haven't fought harder, harder as much as we're fighting, I would tell them, thank you for showing us what life is and for explaining to us what the meaning of humanity is. Thank you for giving us reason to continue and to be inspired. And so it's also a reminder from Hala and from Lama and from Hind uh, and Bisan. from Bisan, right? And from Plastia and from these remarkable women, men, children, um, and adults and our, you know, and our elders, the Nakba survivors who, you know, one has to contemplate how did they survive? And not just survive, but they survived rebuilt a society, resisted, and we inherited this noble, noble struggle. And so there's nothing to say in that moment. Perhaps I would, perhaps I would ask them what we should remember and share. What is the message and what is the mandate that we should continue to carry on all of our behalves? Thank you very much, Nurara Qat. Thank you, Rawa.